Welcome to lecture two in the neuroeconomics course. Uh, today we'll talk about valuation and value-based decision making. And just to give you an outline, this will be split obviously into multiple shorter clips. But we'll talk about rewards, the brain's reward system, and uh, rewards versus losses, again in different clips. We'll talk about reinforcement learning, uh, the reward prediction error, and Riscola Wagner, um, who well, were researchers that, that came up with a model that basically incorporates the re reward prediction error. And finally, we'll talk about value based choice and Antonio Rangel's model that he proposed in 2008. So let's go back uh, a little bit in history and talk about a relatively old study by Olson Milner that was conducted in 1954. And um, what you can see here is you can see a rat in a cage. This is one of the typical cages that I use to, to conduct these experiments, also called a Skinner box. And this rat has an electrode implanted uh, into her brain. So this is uh, a technique we discussed in the uh, methods lecture called microstimulation. And um, they specifically implanted this electrode to uh, well, terminate in this medial forebrain bundle here. So that's, those are the blue neurons in this illustration here. And they connect the hypothalamus to the septal area, which is very close to the orbitofrontal cortex, which we'll talk a lot about in the future. So the electron go goes down into this area and can send um, stimulation uh, electrical stimulation into this region, basically triggering these neurons. And what they found is that uh, this seemed to be very rewarding to the animal. Uh, in fact, so rewarding that the animal was easily trained to push a lever to uh, st self-stimulate, basically. to Every time the animal pushed a lever, uh, a, an amplitude was sent down the electrode into the medial forebrain bundle and therefore triggering these neurons. Um, and the animal would readily learn this, uh, and so much so that in the end the animal would do barely anything else. And you, they saw some of the rats uh, even refusing food over the stimulation, so preferring the stimulation over something that is necessary to sustain, um, well, their well-being in a sense. And also some rats continue to push the lever a few thousand times until they basically collapse from exhaustion. And then as soon as they get up, they would uh, resume this behavior. So it's a very sort of addictive behavior that the animals learned there. Um, and this is in part due to the fact that this is a highly motivating, uh, so this is this uh, medial forebrain bundle here, seems to be part of a system that um, encodes motivation and that encodes rewarding stimuli. And that's exactly what we're going to discuss in, in this lecture. So. One of the earliest studies, basically in a way following up on this, trying to identify variables that are more like what we know from an economics, namely the, the magnitude of, of incentives and the probability of rece receiving these incentives, right? So two factors or parameters that are a fundamental part of expected utility theory. How large is the reward? And how likely is it that we get this reward, uh, which then makes up expected utility? And they looked at whether there are correlates within the in the um, brain of the, of these monkeys. So they used these macaques here, um, and they trained them on a very simple task. And the task was as follows: so the animal would basically look at a computer screen, and the computer screen would tell them which movement would be rewarded. And by movement. In this case, we simply mean an eye, eye movement. So there's an eye tracker, and the computer can tell where the monkey is moving the eye. And if, if, if it's moving, if the instruction is move your eye to the left, and the monkey did so, then he would receive a juice reward. Um, so a drop of juice uh, that can vary in how many drops of juice they, they are that the monkey gets. And um, while the monkey is learning this task or performing this task, uh, the experimenters were recording from um, neurons in lateral interparietal area. And that's an interesting area because we know that it's also involved in sort of accumulating evidence for um, making one movement versus another, particularly when it comes to making saccades, so eye movements. And the question was then, are these types of economic variables are they encoded in neurons that then integrate sort of the visual information and start planning uh, motor instructions. So 
you have to translate this as we discussed in the last lecture, right? So you have to have incoming visual information that tells you what, are, what is happening in the environment. And then you have to start planning or the brain starts planning what kinds of movements, uh, movement options do we have here uh, that lead to the best outcome for me. And you can see that LIP neurons in the simple task. So you just get an instruction at target onset here. Um, they start then firing more vigorously if the instruction is to a, to a location that is associated with a large gain. So now the animal that is thirsty, obviously, in this experiment is expecting to receive a large reward. Whereas in the gray lines, um, it's receiving a small gain, a small uh, amount of, of juice. And the animal knows this at this time. So as soon as the cue onset, uh, the center cue appears, by, based on the color of the center cue, the animal knows, well, I'm going to get a large gain versus I'm going to get a small gain if I make the right movement. Um, so that's exactly what we're seeing here. Uh, we're seeing this relationship between how much the animal is expected to gain and how vigorously the neurons in LIP fire. So indicating that the expected reward is in fact encoded even at this early visual stage. And this continues again at a later stage when the neurons are involved in planning a movement. And this vigor most likely relates with how important the stimulus is to the, uh, to the monkey, uh, which is basically how, how much uh, juice or how much is it getting paid on a given trial. Then in a, in a separate experiment in the same paper by Platin Glimcher uh, from 1999, they looked at outcome probability. So they didn't vary the amount, but they now vary the likelihood of receiving something. Um, so when the animal was instructed to make a movement, it knew it was always the same amount, but with different probabilities. So when there was a high probability uh, to receive a reward, you saw, again, highly vigorous neuronal firing throughout the same stages. So in the early visual stage, when the monkey was just processing what was going on in the visual scene, reward was something that the monkey was already encoding at the level of LIP neurons, or that the LIP neurons in the monkey were encoding. And then later, a smaller relationship was found between, um, between the sort of well, it's, it's still significant in the pre-movement phase and the late cue phase, right? You can see that there is sort of, depending on at what, at what time point we're looking at the relationship between outcome probability and firing rate, there's different levels of relationship, but it's, it's always a positive one throughout these different task trial stages. So this is basically one of the earliest demonstrations that neurons within the brain that are important for understanding the information and, and planning uh, movements um, already reflect the amount of economic value of, uh, of the incoming information and of, of what the monkey is about to do. So we have some evidence that, that obviously economic value is an important aspect of uh, um, how neurons make decisions, basically. Similarly, to show that um, there's subjective encoding of value, so that is relative value um, in, in neurons. Now we're recording from OFC neurons in this study by Tremblay and Schulz. And the task is a little bit different, um, but in many ways similar. So some, one of these stimuli is shown to the monkey, and the monkey then learns for a long training session that each stimulus is associated with a specific reward that the monkey can eat. And again, the monkey is kept Whereas in the first experiment, the monkey is kept thirsty bef just before the experiment. In this experiment, the monkey is kept hungry just before the experiment and uh, therefore is highly motivated to perform the task. So monkeys learn associations between these stimuli uh, that differ, right? So we have three different stimuli in this, in this example and a specific food reward. And that could be a food pellet, which let's say uh, this one is. Uh, it could be a raisin or it could be a piece of banana or a piece of apple. And each monkey would value these things differently. So let's say some monkey values a piece of apple more than a raisin. And that would be this example here. Then whenever the monkey sees this, this stimulus, um, just before opening the box, um, he would then have more vigorous firing towards a, a reward that he prefers more relative to a reward that he prefers less. 
on these types of trials where mostly um, apples versus raisins are presented. On another day, when the monkey is being presented with raisins, which is in this case the least preferred reward or has a low reward value, versus a food pellet that he has free access to in his cage anyway, then you see the same situation playing out here, right? So vigorous firing in response to rewards that are now relatively preferred relative to um, rewards that are now relatively less preferred. So the same happens here. So neurons basically adjust their firing rates to the um, context that, that they're making decisions in or that they're performing in, right? So when, they, when there's a highly valued reward to a relatively less valued reward, you see always this pattern um, depending on what the comparison is based on. So to summarize this, this study was the first to show that uh, neurons in the orbitofrontal cortex engage in subjective value or relative coding of rewards. So while this stimulus and this stimulus are identical, so they predict in both cases um, the re receipt of, let's say, a raisin, um, depending on in which context this raisin is presented, either with a higher valued uh, outcome or a lower valued outcome, the firing rates to the same exact stimulus change. However, the firing rates to the more valued uh, stimulus, so in this case that's the apple, and in this case that's the, app, uh, the, the raisin, are about the same. And the firing rates to the least valued stimulus, in this case that's the raisin, and in this case that's the food pellet, are about the same. So there's relative coding um, of, of rewards within the brain. So let's talk a little bit more about the rewards and then move on to talking about the reward system, which will be covered in a separate video. What are rewards for people? Well, obviously foods are highly rewarding to us, especially tasty foods. Um, some people might like sushis, others might not. Might not. Uh, some people might like beer, and this is one of my favorite beers here. Others might not. Um, many people like money. So there, there are many different rewards, many different things that motivate us uh, to, to work for these, these types of outcomes, right? Um, and obviously that's what all of you are doing right now. Um, maybe this is something that motivates you, but one of the outcomes obviously of obtaining a master's degree at, at a reputed university is to end up with this degree and hopefully get a better job that, that also pays more. But obviously what's more important to us is how fulfilling our careers are. So, but in any case, these are all rewards. And um, there's something that struck me a, a few years ago when I read this in the literature. Um, and this is also what these early two studies have shown us. So when we talk about rewards, then in fact, we should expect this valuation mechanism. So how good or bad is something for me, the organism that is making these decisions? They should be built into our nervous system at every level, from the single neuron to the complex decision algorithms that are used in social sit settings. And this is a quote from Montague et al. in 2004, and that's something that struck me. So we should find representations of rewards throughout every level of, of how the brain is making decisions, including lower level um, visual activity, right? And, and even single neurons should incorporate uh, rewards into their firing rates. And that's exactly what we saw in these earlier two, two uh, uh, studies. So the definition of re reward from uh, the Merriam-Webster dictionary is that it's a stimulus that, it, that is administered to an organism following a correct or desired response, and then in return increases the probability of that response. So it's something that trains us to uh, repeat behaviors that are good and avoid behaviors that are bad in a sense, right? So we have, well, obviously rewards are things that repeat behaviors that are good because they're the good side of the, of the story. You could say that rewards are the outcomes of our desires and goals and therefore they're the things that we work for. So they are in a sense what motivate us. Um, in general, Anytime we perform something, an action that leads to a reward, these should improve our re reproductive success 
or our evolutionary fitness. Uh, and that is typically the case when it comes to performing action to get food. We obviously need food to sustain ourselves and, and make sure that we're, we're healthy. Uh, there are some exceptions to this, and those are drugs of abuse. Drugs of abuse including cigarettes, cocaine, amphetamines, those kinds of things um, that you all know well. And what they do is, in a sense, they hijack the reward system. They trigger a um, massive release of, of dopamine, for instance, and that obviously feels good. And that obviously, given uh, the definitions above here and what we know about reinforcement learning, that then leads to an increase in behaviors that, again, lead to similar outcomes. So they're also um, part of conditioning. And uh, more recently, anything related to screens. There's social media addiction, there's now video game addiction, and this is, has become a, an official disorder. Um, things that also are designed to drive our dopamine system, our reward system, and uh, form habits, shape habits in our behaviors, which we all see when we check someone's uh, Insta feed in, in the mornings, right? Um, immediately after we wake up. Video games are a bit of a funny, um, uh, what do you want to call this sort of, sort of category in this? They are highly addictive for some people, not for all of them, but they're also now jobs for some people. So there's, uh, they can pay quite a bit. These are annual earnings in, in thousands of dollars. So people make millions being very good at video games. Obviously, it's not a very healthy activity, right? You end up uh, having um, all sorts of bodily problems um, at the age of 25 after a successful video game career. So one of the questions that we're going to answer in the next video is, what is the neural basis of reward processing? And we've seen some of the early studies that looked into this, some of the most, imp well, some very important studies in the field of neuroeconomics that started up the field in a sense. Um, so there is actually converging evidence that has implicated a very well-defined system in reward processing. And that system is what we'll discuss in the next video. So I see you soon.